Okay, this is going to be chapter four of the reappearance of Rachel Price. Please make sure that you're liking, commenting, and subscribing before we start this video. Um, it does really help me out a lot, and I appreciate it. So, here we go. Four. Rachel Price, alive again, brought back through time, lips grazing her bared teeth as she smiled through the cold. Jeff, she said in a voice that almost sounded real. Are you recording? What gave you that idea? Came just... Jeff's voice distorted and crackly too close to the microphone. The camera in my hand? Jeff from now laughed at his own joke. The angle shifted as past Jeff stepped forward and now Belle could see a well-padded baby in the cradle of Rachel's arm, body in line with hers, fast asleep. Not just a baby, it was Belle. She knew that, yet she felt detached from the small sleeping child. They were from two different worlds. Look at you, Sherry from now said, just as the past version of her spoke too. I'm giving up and no one's helping me with the snowman. Younger Sherry walked on screen, Prince following her in the snow. Charlie too. They were bundled up in thick coats and thick coats and gloves, hats that swallowed half their frosted pink faces. A snowball exploded against Sherry's chest, spattering white dust on her chin. Jeff, I'll kill you, she growled at the camera. You could have hit the baby. Anna's fine, Rachel smiled down at the baby, eyes glittering. She can sleep through anything. Belle forgot for a moment that that was her, the first part of her name that she'd amputated years ago. She didn't know Rachel had called her Anna. No one had ever told her. Come on, Charlie, Jeff. One of you hop on, came Grandpa's old voice, older but younger. He still sounded like himself. Belle missed that. The camera panned to find him, squatting on a blue shed a blue sled that was far too small for him, let alone another grown man. A grin split from her dad's face, this younger version of him in the snow. He squeezed Rachel's shoulder as he passed, giggling when he dropped onto the front of the sled tucked between Grandpa's legs. Go on, Dad, Jeff called. Grandpa kicked off against the snow and the sled started to move. Jeff chafed, Jeff chased after them, feet crunching. The camera swerved, and Belle finally knew where they all were. She could tell by the junk pile of rusted cars and dead equipment in the distance behind them. She recognized the old red truck in the middle of the pileup, and the tall framework she always thought had, thought looked like a mechanical giraffe. Called it Larry. They were at Price and Sons Logging Yard, owned by Grandpa and his dad and Grandpa before him. It had gone out of business maybe 30 years ago before her dad or Jeff had really had a chance to become those sons, but it had a good slope down toward the river and was the perfect place to sled when the snow was right, as long as she didn't go anywhere near all the old trucks and saws and dangerous equipment, otherwise Grandpa got mad. He wasn't mad th now, though, laughing as he and Charlie sped down the hill. The sled tipped over. Charlie did it on purpose, a cascade of snow glittering down on him and Grandpa. They laughed and laughed in the way that hurts if you do it too long, half buried there. Rachel's voice floated in from behind the camera, detached from her body. Oh no, they're gone, Anna. We lost them in the snow forever. The clip ended and the television screen went dark. Wow, Sherry was the first to speak. You forgot just how young she was when it happened. So young, Jeff agreed. I mean, there's only nine years now, Belle, between you and your mom there. It felt much greater than that. There was quite an age difference between you all, wasn't there? Ramsey said. Nine years, Charlie, between you and Rachel. Yes, Charlie said, speaking around the lump in his throat. No one else would hear it but Bell. He fiddled with his left hand. How is it how is it for you to see those happy family memories? It's hard, Charlie sniffed. When I see Rachel smiling like that, it makes me want to smile too, with her, like it's instinct. She was infectious like that. I know it's a thing people say, and maybe she didn't light up every room, but she lit up every room for me. He paused. Bell glanced back and saw that his eyes had gone glassy. The silent threat of tears, of silent tears. But I know I'll never see her again, and it takes my body a few seconds to catch up. It's hard, he summed up again. Sometimes it's easier not to see her face. I can't help but notice you're still wearing your wedding ring, Ramsey said. Bell couldn't help but notice either now because her dad was fiddling it fiddling with it, spinning it around the pudge of his finger backward and forward. Charlie looked at it like he was seeing it for the first time. Yes, I still wear my wedding ring. A small, pained smile. If I'm being honest, I'm not sure I could take it off anymore if I wanted to. He attempted it, pulling at the metal band. No, stuck on there pretty good. Guess my fingers are a little fatter than they used to be. It's engraved on the inside, the date of our wedding, July 23rd, 2005, best day of my life. An empty laugh to push away the tears. 
I like wearing the ring. It's a little reminder of Rachel, of the life we had together, however short it was. I mean, she's still here in some small way. That's really sweet, Charlie, Sherry commented, leaning across to pat him on the knee. Going to make me cry over here. Ramsey looked almost annoyed at the intrusion. The moment gone, Dad's face now, Dad's face straightened out. Now, Carter, Graham, Ramsey said, and she almost dropped so surprised at the sound of her own name. You never knew your Aunt Rachel. You were born four months after she went missing. What was... What has that been like, growing up with Rachel having such a presence in your life when you had never actually met her? Carter cleared her throat, shifting her legs. I mean, it's... I think it's the word you said. Present. She might have disappeared, but she's always been a part of our family. One of the prices, even though we had no overlap. It's like with older relatives you never meet, like Grandma Price. She gestured at Grandpa, who stared ahead at nothing. You feel like you know them because of the memories and stories people share. And without Rachel... I wouldn't have Belle, so Carter trailed off smiling at Belle instead, and somehow that said enough, that said more, but it wouldn't last forever. People didn't, and Carter would be gone in two and a bit years. Great answer, honey, Sherry said, dabbing her eyes. Carter shifted her legs back. Yes, it was, Ramsey agreed, and in some small way you did overlap with Rachel in that clip, because Sherry, you would have been pregnant with Carter that Christmas, wouldn't you? Sherry's eyes calculated, flicking back and forth. Yes, she said. You're right. It would have been early on. I wasn't yet showing. Thank God, otherwise we would have had to cart you around on that sled. Charlie leaned forward to tease her, his breath in Belle's air his breath in Belle's hair. She just ballooned up like a whale at what, six, seven months? And then Charlie stopped her up his nose. Well, then I was arrested in June, in custody, so I never got to see you at your biggest. Didn't actually get to meet Carter until she was six months old. It's a great feeling when your brother-in-law refers to you as a whale, Sherry laughed, stretching her powdered sugar skin. But he's right. I did just pop out of nowhere. I remember, we hadn't really told anyone yet. Jeff and I struggled for a long time to have a baby. She took Jeff's hand out of his lap. We'd been trying almost ten years, so we'd learned to keep things to ourselves, to not get too excited in those early stages. I was 38 when we had Carter, our miracle baby. But then, you know, it was everything going on with Rachel's disappearance, and we didn't want to add to any of that stress and upheaval, so we kept it to ourselves until we couldn't keep it to ourselves anymore. Because of the whale belly, Charlie added. Well, she didn't... She doesn't look like a whale anymore. Sherry bent forward to tickle the sides of Carter's long neck. Carter tried to pull away, and Sherry dropped the smile, but her dimples stayed. And after life preserved in makeup, she withdrew and looked up at Ramsey. Sorry, I know that's not what this documentary is about. Us. You can cut the useless parts out, right? No, no, Ramsey corrected her. This is what the documentary is about. All this life stuff, family stuff, and how Rachel's disappearance affected other aspects of everyday life people wouldn't think of. You keeping your pregnancy under wraps. Charlie not meeting his niece until she was six months old because of the trial. That's the story I'm interested in telling. The Rachel in everything. It's all good stuff. All good stuff, Carter. Sherry glowed running her fingers through her daughter's copper hair. We must have known she was going to be tall and beautiful, huh? Named her after Carter Dome. It's a mountain close by. That's where me and Jeff. Charlie coughed, cutting her off, choking on nothing. What? Sherry turned to him. Belle did too. Charlie laughed awkwardly through his nose. I know Ramsey asked for hon honesty, but you'll have to say everything on camera. What are you talking about? Sherry rounded on him. It's where me and Jeff got engaged. Oh, Charlie said, lips puckered out, holding to the shape, then a ladder. Oh, before he cracked up, a loud wheezing laugh that came from the ribs. I thought you were going to say that's where Carter was, you know, conceived. What? No, what Sherry screeched, hands raised in defense. Did you really think that was the reason we named her that? Dad! Belle did her duty, telling him off, splitting the word into two disapproving syllables. Jeff and Sherry were hooting now, too. Ugh, Uncle Charlie! Carter pulled a face, looking out at Ramsey and the rest of the crew. I guess you can't choose your family, can you? She said with a sniff. This is perfect, guys. Ramsey grinned down at the monitor. Really great. The next clip is from January 2009. He pressed a button and the television static crackled back into life, taking them to a different living room, the one in Grandpa's house. The shot settled on the chair in the corner of the room. Belle was sitting on Grandpa's lap while he read to her from a green hardcover book. She was much bigger than they'd last seen her, but still tiny, the book almost as big as she was. The memory thief studied the back of her pretty red head. Grandpa was reading out in his deep storybook voice. The knife still clutched in his hand. 
Pat, Sherry's voice chimed in from behind the camera. Pretty sure that book is far too old for her. It doesn't even have pictures. Don't be silly, Sherry. Grandpa shot her down, returning his eyes to the book. She doesn't know what it's about, just likes the sounds. Don't you, Annabelle? Ye, Papa, little Annabelle said, well on her way to three years old, fingers tracing the pages. She loves it. It's a special book, isn't it, little one? And the camera shuffled over to a car seat positioned by the sofa. There was a new sleeping baby there, a pink-faced Carter. They should be back soon, shouldn't they? Sherry said, a quiver in her voice. Any minute, Grandpa replied. One of his two. Wait, Sherry's breath rattled, windstorm hard behind the camera. I hear a car. I think it's them. Annabelle, come with me, honey. Sherry hurried out of the room, blurring the shot. She pulled the front door open, the chirping sounds of a small girl behind her. Annabelle, it's your daddy. Look. A small black truck had pulled up outside the house. The driver's side door opened and Charlie stepped out wearing a smart suit, the tie undone into two loose snakes flapping over his shoulders. Where is she? He called to Sherry Grain. Where's Annabelle? The angle, the angle shuddered as a small blonde head pushed through Sherry's legs. There she is. Charlie crouched down with his arms outstretched, voice thick with tears already. Uncle Jeff stepped out of the truck behind him, but Charlie only had eyes for her. Come here, little... Come here, baby girl. My daddy! Small Annabelle screeched as her little legs reached beneath, raised beneath her, unsteady and unbalanced, jumping toward him head first. Her dad caught her before she hit the ground. He straightened up, holding her tightly in his arms, her face buried next to his, coming up wet with his kisses and his tears. Daddy's home, he said into her ruffled hair. Not leaving again, never leaving you again. I promise, Annabelle. The small child nodded, snatching his promise from the air, pressing his her hand to his mouth. Charlie blew a loud raspberry against it. Daddy, stop it. Come see my baby. She pointed a stubby finger back toward the camera, back toward her 18-year-old self, sitting on the living room floor, watching. The screen went dark. A sniff behind Belle. Her dad was crying in this timeline, too, dabbling at his eyes with his darkening sleeves. Sorry, he coughed, embarrassed. Belle wrapped her arms around one of his legs. No, don't be sorry at all, Ramsey said gently. Can you tell us what was happening in that clip? Not sure I can. Charlie shed a shuddering huff. He hid his face. Sherry was crying, too, in a prettier way, face intact. And Grandpa wouldn't remember. That left only Jeff. That was the day of the verdict. He said, finally getting a word in edgewise. The jury reached the decision after two days of deliberation. Sherry stayed home to watch the kids. Dad couldn't bear to come to the courthouse. He was sick with nerves, terrified it would be a guilty verdict, so I went alone. The jury returned a verdict of not guilty, which meant that Charlie was finally free, that he could finally come home. It was an emotional day. You spent a total of seven months in custody, Charlie, awaiting trial. Ramsey tried with him again. That must have felt like a very long time. Charlie nodded. Too long. To be away from Belle when she was so young. But that was a good day. Bittersweet because we still didn't have Rachel and no answers on what really happened to her. But it was the end of such an awful period of my life. I was just so happy to be back with my family. We were happy to have you back, Jeff added. Yes, Sherry sniffed. Not that we didn't love having Belle. She came to live with us when Charlie was arrested and we had a new baby on the way imminently. Went from having no children in the house to two in very quick succession. It was, Sherry paused, chewing on the thought, eventful. A little overwhelming, but Belle was a very sweet girl. She used to ask us, where's mommy? Where's daddy? Didn't she, Jeff? But eventually she stopped asking. And once Carter arrived, Belle was obsessed with her. Used to call her my baby like you saw there. Belle turned to Carter, mouth my baby at her, more demonically than Sherry had described it. Carter snorted. And Patrick helped us out a lot, too. A lot, didn't you? Sherry directed the words towards Grandpa. We had a home birth when Carter arrived. I'm not into hospitals or needles and all of that crap. All of that crap. Didn't, don't get her started on homeopathic teas. So Pat took Belle for a few days when Carter was born. He helped us a lot with the girls, loves his granddaughters. You loved, you loved reading to Belle, didn't you, Pat? We were all figuring everything out together as a family unit. I think we did a pretty good job. <laughs> yes, you did, Charlie said softly. And I'm so grateful you were all there for Belle when I couldn't be. I'll never be able to thank you enough. Don't think I've said it as much as I should. You don't need to. Jeff looked across Sherry at him, brother to brother. That's what family is for. I had no doubt they were going to find you innocent that day. That's why I took Charlie's truck to the courthouse. I knew he would want to drive it home, a free man. 
That's right, Charlie said, wiping his eyes. My Ford F-Series. I loved that truck. I'd only bought it a few weeks before I was arrested, and I... Gotta go to the bathroom, Jeff muttered quickly, standing up and walking away from the sofa before anyone could say anything. Ramsey's eyes widened. The rest of the crew exchanged looks. Jeff, you can't just... But Jeff could, because he was already gone out into the hallway, closing the bathroom door behind him. Not good at reading rooms, Uncle Jeff. A moment later, Ash pulled a pained face, lifting the headphones off his ears, holding them over his head like a crown. He's still got his mic on, he said. You can hear him peeing? Belle asked. Oh yeah, really going for it. Carter smacked her forehead. Kill me now, honestly. I thought he didn't ju- I thought he just didn't want anyone to see him cry, Charlie said, finally drying his eyes. But on the topic of peeing in my favorite truck, he began. Don't you dare, Belle spun around to shoot him a look. Charlie giggled, ruffling her hair. Go on, he said. It's cute. No, it was not cute. The very opposite. And there was an entire British film crew here, not to mention the camera. Her dad poked her in the back. I've already started now. Belle sighed, turned away. Well, fine, if it cheered him up. But she wasn't going to help him tell it. I love that truck, Charlie said to Ramsey, throwing himself right into the story, permission granted. Would have kept it forever, but Belle and I were in North Conway. Can't remember the reason now. Belle did. We went to Storyland for my 12th birthday. Right, Charlie said. We stopped at Taco Bell on the drive home. I leave Bell in the truck while I go in to grab the food. And when I come back out, she'd wet herself all over the back seat. He chuckled, telling the story with his hands, too. I mean, everywhere. So much pee. Uncle Charlie, Carter said, voice chiding, deep, dipping deeper with his name. You left me there for, like, three hours, Bell protested, a heat in her cheeks that was worse than the story itself. Charlie laughed harder. It was ten minutes. Fifteen tops. Too many milkshakes at Storyland, I think, kiddo. He leaned all the way forward, wrapping her in a bear hug from behind, an annoying number of kisses on the top of her head. But we could never get the pee smell out. So that was the end of my beautiful truck. My first drive as a free man. Rip, Belle grumbled. Rest in pee, he added. Belle wouldn't dignify that with an answer. The sound of a toilet flushing, Jeff whistling as he came back in. Definitely didn't wash his hands then. Carter sank even farther into the floor. Jeff, Ramsey stood up, voices tight, voices light and breezy as he can make it. No big deal, but next time, could you wait until we aren't in the middle of a segment to go to the toilet? I really had to pee, Jeff said, retaking his place on the couch. Oh, we know, asked Rudder, replacing the headphones over his ears. I wanted to return I wanted to return to something Jeff said about that clip, Ramsey said. Then, somehow softening and raising his voice at the same time, he added, Patrick, do you remember why you didn't want to go to the courthouse the day the verdict was read? Patrick What? Grandpa croaked at his name. Were you nervous the verdict was going to be guilty? Who's that? Charlie shifted on the sofa and moving closer to Grandpa. Dad, he said softly, he's asking me about the trial. Remember? About Rachel? Rachel, Grandpa said, choking over the sharp word, a cobweb of dried spit at the corner of his mouth. Rachel, Charlie's girlfriend. Wife, Charlie corrected him with a gentle smile. It's okay. Take your time, Dad. Charlie brought himself even closer, arm around Grandpa's shoulders. Rachel, he tried again. She, she was, wasn't she? Stop it. Grandpa spat suddenly, picking one hand up from his leg and flinging it toward Charlie's face. The slap made contact, just a sharp burst, just a soft burst of violence before Charlie caught Grandpa's hand, cupping it gently between his much bigger hands. Safe hands. It's okay, Dad, he whispered to him. I'm here. You have nothing to worry about. Jeff? Grandpa asked him. No, it's Charlie. I'm here. Jordan stood to attention at the back of the room. It's okay, Charlie said to him, glancing at Belle to tell her as well. And it was okay, if her dad said it was. He turned his gaze to Ramsey. Dad lost a lot of his memory when he had his first stroke last summer. It was a bad one, but in a wheelchair since the second. He has vascular dementia, so he's losing more of his working memory, his speech, old memories. He can get aggressive without meaning to. Ramsey probably knew all of this. Her dad must have explained it already. Maybe he was saying it now for the camera so people didn't think Grandpa was just mean. I think he's lost most of the time that Rachel was with us. I'm not sure he even remembers the girls, Charlie said sadly, refusing to look down at them. Not remembering was a little like leaving. He doesn't have those memories anymore. I'm not sure it's fair of us to ask him about Rachel. It will only distress him. And maybe Belle was the only one who could truly understand that. Of course, I'm sorry, Ramsey said. I shouldn't have. I thought I saw him smiling during the video. I'm sorry. It's okay. 
are we okay to carry on? And they were because dad said it, a small red mark growing on his cheek. This final clip is an important one. Ramsey said zeroing in on Bell instead. Great. Her in the spotlight. Her turn in the spotlight. She'd been trying to go unnoticed, which was not the same as disappeared. Sherry and dad were easy shields. The reason this one is special, Ramsey continued, is because it might be the last ever video of Rachel Price other than the security footage from the White Mountains Mall. This video was taken by Rachel on February 11, 2008, two days before she disappeared. He let that hang in the air for a moment. Here we go. He pressed play. A close-up of a child in a yellow onesie lying on, a, lying on the carpet, a gummy baby tooth smile at the camera above. Bare chubby feet pressed together like thoughtful hands waiting for something. Who's the best girl in the world? The voice behind the camera asked, soft and breathy and sure, like it already knew the answer. Familiar somehow, too. One oversized hand reached down, coming from the sky to tickle the young child. She giggled, balling her little baby fists, spitting bubbles as her happy tongue poked through, freezing when the hand withdrew, like she only came alive at the touch. Tickled again. Are you a mommy's girl? The voice asked. The child squealed in response. You are, aren't you? You're a mommy's girl, Annabelle Boo. Mama, the child answered, stilted and bright. Yes, Anna, you love your mama, huh? Tess, said the child, confident it was a word. Tess, ah, mama, blonte. Confident that that was a sentence. Yeah, good girl, Rachel said, pretending to understand. And mommy loves you more than anything in the whole wide world, doesn't she? There was a sound, the soft crash of the front door closing somewhere off camera. You're here already, Charlie's voice muffled in the background. How did you get home? Jules gave me a ride, Rachel replied. I would have come, I would have come get you, he said. Rachel, honey closer now. You didn't shut the front door again. You really need to check. It's freezing now. Aren't you cold? Not really, she answered. We're not cold, are we, baby girl? Young Annabelle hitched up her feet, blowing another happy bubble. The clip ended. Black screen. Belle swallowed a wad of thick saliva sticking in her throat. The room was silent, everyone waiting for her to say something. Yeah, she said, which might as well have been nothing. I hadn't seen that before. Saying something without saying anything, Belle turned back to the camera, watching Ash's eyes on the way over. He gave her a small double thumbs up, held tightly to his strawberry-covered chest. Ugh, he could shove those thumbs up his... What are you thinking, Belle? Ramsey asked. How does it make you feel seeing that clip, just two days before everything changed forever? How did it make her feel? Uncomfortable, throat swollen, sweaty palmed. It's nice, she lied, to see a normal moment like that. I don't remember any with her, but I seemed happy there. Yes, you did. An encouraging smile on Ramsey's face. Added Rachel, I think. Very happy. No hint of the impending disaster. I got emotional when I first saw it, I'll admit, he said, because it's just so clear how much your mom loved you. Did she? More than anything in the whole wide world. Well then, why did she leave Belle behind in the back seat of her car just 48 hours later? Disappeared forever. Explain that one. Another thing I couldn't help but notice, Ramsey continued. He couldn't help noticing a lot, huh? Should see a doctor about that. There's a physical resemblance between you and Rachel, but the thing that gets me here is how similar the two of you sound. Your voices when you speak are almost exactly the same. Yeah, I noticed that, Jeff chimed in. Really similar now, you're all grown up. We'd probably get you two mixed up all the time on the phone if, yeah, if. Belle knew they were right. It was the reason Rachel's voice felt familiar, because she definitely wasn't recalling it from memories. She had none. Ramsey was waiting for her to answer, but she didn't want to speak in Rachel's voice again. Something else we saw in the clip. Ramsey turned his attention to her dad instead. Charlie, at your trial on December 2008, 2008, you gave evidence that in the months and weeks leading up to Rachel's disappearance, you noticed a change in her behavior, that she was becoming forgetful, seemed preoccupied, distracted. Those were the words you used. Could you tell us about that? Charlie sat up straighter, the old sofa creaking beneath him. It was nothing major, just like you saw there with the front door. Rachel was forgetting things she didn't used to, leaving the oven on, burning food, forgetting that Belle was in the bathtub, stove, faucets, windows, baby monitor, things like that. I thought it was a case of the, what do you call it again? Yeah, baby brain. Maybe going back to work even part-time is too soon or something. I'm sure that's all it was. 
Belle shifted the floor suddenly too hard beneath her because she wasn't so sure that was all it was. Leaving the front door open when she didn't mean to, water still running after she gotten out of the shower, not sealing the trash can even though it was black bear season and she knew she had to do that and thought she had. Her dad was never mad. If anything, he was too nice about it. Had he noticed the similarities, he'd never mentioned it, which was good because Belle didn't want to be anything like Rachel Price. If she lit up rooms, Belle would darken them. If she was forgetful, Belle had to try that much harder not to be. And Belle, Ramsey said, I know it's been 16 years and you think your mom is most likely dead, but if she did somehow come back after all this time, what would you want to say to her? Belle didn't even know how to begin to answer that, and that was fine. She didn't owe Ramsey anything in her head. She could keep some back for herself. I don't I don't know. I didn't really know her. I know, Charlie said, stepping in and saving her. I thought about it a lot, have dreams about it even. I would just want to hold her, wrap my arms around her and just tell her how much I love her, how much I miss her, before any questions, those can come later. Sherry blew her nose loudly. You okay, honey? Jeff asked her. She waved him off. It won't ever happen, I know that, Charlie said, voice splitting into catching the tears before they fell. But that's what I'd do.